All right, I'm Stuart Schwartz, the Executive Director of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Uh, welcome to our Bus Network Redesign Forum today, uh, hosted by uh, CSG along with the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. And we have Julie Coons here, uh, CEO of the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce as part of the Metro Now Coalition and our Bus Champion Series, that, of which this is the second event. Uh, also joining us are John Hillegas, from the Greater Washington Partnership and Laura Miller Brooks from the Federal City Council and probably some other members of our Metro Now Coalition. Uh, the first forum we did uh, just a couple of weeks ago involved uh, uh, the progress report that John and Laura wrote for Metro Now on the bus transformation project. Uh, I'll have them put the progress report link into the chat. Um, and they'll also uh, put the original bus transformation project report into the chat. Uh, that was uh, an initiative of WMATA in cooperation with officials from across the region and the transit agencies across the region. Many members of the Metro Now Coalition served on the um, uh, Bus Transformation Project Executive Committee. Uh, and it reflects the commitment, not just of the nonprofit advocacy community, but of the business community to better buses in the region. Uh, um, among the recommendations of the bus transportation project was a bus network redesign and dedicated lanes. Uh, today we'll focus on bus network re redesign with two of the premier firms in the field. Uh, there, we're fortunate to have them, you know, here in the DC region. Uh, the two folks that are joining us, Laura Biala from Foursquare ITP and Scudder Wag from Jarrett Walker Associates. At future events, we'll talk about dedicated bus lanes, fares and technology and other things that are part of bus transformation. And we're hoping each of you will join us to be bus champions. Uh, before we start our presentations, I'd like to introduce Julie, the CEO of the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, the Northern Virginia Chamber is a founding member of Metro Now, and they are our co-host today. Julie, turning over to you. Stuart, thank you so much, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I want to expand a little bit on what Stuart had to say about the Metro Now Coalition. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's made up of regional leaders from the business, nonprofit, and advocacy communities who believe transit is integral to the equitable growth of our region. Um, our coalition first came together in 2018 to secure dedicated funding to put Metro on a sustainable path forward. Uh, following that success, we expanded our commitment to regional mobility and equity by launching the Better Bus campaign, uh, which we're uh, continuing to talk about today. We are at an incredible time uh, for transit and buses in particular, with unprecedented challenges like a national bus driver and mechanic shortage, and the lingering impacts of a pandemic. But while we do face major challenges, we also have many opportunities. Historic levels of funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will soon begin to flow across the country. Local and state leaders are making major investments in transit, like dedicated bus lanes in the district and bus rapid transit in Fairfax County. And after long last, the opening of the Silver Line Phase 2 is set to happen later this spring. I see, I see a lot of cheers on that one. <laughs> In this context, I'm excited to be here today to talk about how important bus service is to a healthy economy. For many riders, it is the only reliable way they can get to work. In our region, over 80% of bus riders are people of color which means prioritizing bus service is also a key part of regional equity, not just the economy. Lastly, it's important to look at bus service as a regional service and invest in it as such. Together, we can create a better regional bus network designed to move more people more efficiently. And that's truly what we're talking about today. So I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing Mayor Justin Wilson of the city of Alexandria. Justin Wilson was first elected mayor in 2018 after serving on the city council for the eight years prior. As mayor, he represents the city regionally on the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Board of Directors. Mayor Wilson's leadership has led to new investments in schools, transportation, and environmental infrastructure. Under his leadership, Alexandria funded and implemented the DASH bus network redesign 
He has worked to expand early childhood education, address growing student enrollment, accelerate economic growth, advance climate policy, as well as protecting and expanding housing affordability. Uh, I think we had a brief comment that mayor is like four jobs, not just one job. And I think that's quite clear. Prior to his election to the city council, Mayor Wilson served as the chair of the Alexandria Transit Company Board of Directors, which operates the city's dash bus service and served on the budget and fiscal affairs advisory committee. He is employed, not just as mayor, uh, but uh, by uh, Amtrak as a senior director. Welcome, Mayor Justin Wilson. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julie. Thank you uh, for uh, to, to Stuart and Coalition for Smart Growth for uh, for all of your leadership and uh, and work in this area. It's a pleasure to be here and to be a uh, part of this. I'm glad Julie mentioned in my bio that prior to coming on council, I was uh, the chair of uh, the board of directors of Dash. It's one of the most enjoyable things I ever did as a uh, as a in, in civic life. It was a uh, it was a hard transition uh, when I ran for office originally to have to leave that board and not be able to uh, to be directly involved. I've been a, a daily transit rider for, for over 20 years now, and and uh, and I liked having my hands in that stuff on a daily basis. Um, so I think I've tried to keep uh, that focus on uh, on transit as I moved on to the city council and, and later mayor um, to make sure I, uh, I keep that commitment. So, um, you know, this is a great time to be having this conversation. And I, and I wish I could say that in Alexandria, we had... Uh, we had uh, always planned this out. You know, we knew this was going to be this international pandemic, and so we did several years of planning in advance uh, to be ready and to adjust. Um, but in some ways, uh, we we got lucky um, on the timing. Um, you know, so so much of what we do in uh, in local government is around uh, managing change, and, and I think because of that, it's it's there's a bias to kind of very modest change and tweaks and adjustments here and there and uh, really against uh, transformational change. And I think this was one of those opportunities for us where I think we were able to pull together the, uh, the, uh, the, the support um, and the uh, inertia around making some very significant change uh, to a critical service that so many of our residents uh, rely on. Um, we, uh, we launched the uh, Transit Vision uh, Plan uh, several years ago. This was a three-year uh, bus uh, re network redesign effort for us in the city. Um, this is not something we just kind of waved a magic wand on. Um, there was an enormous amount of engagement with some uh, some great partners. You're going to hear from uh, some of them later uh, in this uh, in this presentation, um, and uh, and really a lot of uh, input from um, from our residents. Um, uh, including our, uh, our our transit riders, uh, making sure that they were part of uh, of this discussion from the beginning. Um, this ultimately culminated in the launch of our network uh, on September fifth, and that's really just the first phase. And I think it's 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 important to emphasize that we are just getting started um, in what we are doing in uh, in transit in Alexandria. Um, our redesign involved uh, really an overhaul of uh, not only our DASH uh, route network, um, but uh, also coordinating uh, with our partners at WMATA for, uh, for many of the Metro bus routes that run in the city and making sure that this was not an island, this was not just something we were doing on our own, it was coordinated um, with, our, with our regional partners. And you know, this was a, an opportunity to look at a network that um, had originally launched on, on March 11th, 1984, uh, my birthday, um, and uh, and had been largely unchanged uh, for uh, for the decades following that. So you think about the enormous change that we've seen in our city um, during uh, those uh, those decades. And basically, if you looked at the dash route network uh, from 1984 and you compared it to what we had in place until uh, late August of this year, it wasn't dramatically different. And we had added routes, uh, we had made some changes and tweaks. Um, but the the basic scale, the, the, the framework of that uh, of that network was largely the same, and I think that's what uh, was so exciting about this effort was this opportunity to kind of rethink a lot of those assumptions, knowing that you know now over half of our population lives west of Quaker Lane in the west end of our city, um, and that's where we've seen some of the greatest growth, and particularly uh, folks who rely on uh, on transit 
on a regular basis. Job centers that have built up around transit, I will note. Um, job centers that did not exist uh, uh, 30 years ago, now, uh, now serving um, you know, different communities, different parts of our community. And so it was really a great opportunity to, uh, to have this conversation. And you know, we went into this conversation with a desire to kind of shift um, the balance of how our routes were structured, you know, going from a model of um, you know, trying to cover as much geography as possible um, and covering as much space in our city and making sure that our lines went through all of the areas of our city to a situation where we were trying to cover more ridership and, uh, and making sure we added more frequent service uh, to more of, uh, of, of our communities in our city, trying to help them be able to get to from places, uh, you know, where they want to go. And, um, you know, as, as was noted earlier, you know, in, in particularly in the west end of our city where we shifted a lot of the capacity as part of this um, network change, that's where we have uh, more of our communities of color, more of our immigrant populations, more of our, our lower income communities um, who uh, are, are transit dependent, dependent and can really benefit from um, some of these investments. The other thing that we did as part of this, and, and I always wait in, later in the presentation to talk about this um, because it's only part of what we did, is we also got rid of fares at the same time. And um, you know, the, this, this was actually something that we had not um, planned on as we were going through the, the transit vision effort. And I think this is something where we took an opportunity um, presented by the pandemic, a very low ridership, a, a trip program that was sponsored by the Commonwealth Department of uh, Rail and Public Transit that allows us uh, to, to draw on some uh, state resources, and we've been able to uh, to get rid of uh, uh, fares um, on on Dash when we launched that network. And so, um, you know, the the excitement of this is um, is uh, that we've now been able to collect and see some numbers um, as uh, as we've put this in place, and uh, and we've been able to see that it has uh, we were able to in December reach ninety three percent of our pre COVID uh, ridership levels. Uh, and, um, and we had been uh, under 50% of pre-COVID uh, for much of 2021. And, um, and, and I think what we've, uh, the monthly ridership has increased uh, by 50% from August uh, to October. And so that's an enormous uh, achievement at a time where it's been very, very difficult uh, for transit. And so this is uh, an opportunity for us to get people back on transit, make our, our, our routes uh, more relevant, um, provide more frequent service. And, and as I said earlier, we're just getting started. So. Um, I, uh, I look forward to the, uh, the other presentations. Um, I appreciate uh, you guys having me as part of this and, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, later in the program. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. It's just terrific uh, to have your leadership and the leadership of other elected officials for better buses, better transit in our region. Let's get to, the, uh, to our presenters uh, now. I will um, uh, tell you that we are extremely fortunate to have Laura Bayala today, founder and CEO of Foursquare ITP. I'll go ahead and I'll put her bio in the chat in just a second, as well as Scudder Wag of Jarrett Walker Associates. Uh, you know, Foursquare headquarters right here in DC. Uh, Jarrett Walker Associates has an office led by Scudder right here in Arlington in uh, Crystal City. I will be uh, say we are certainly fans of both firms and as advocates have learned from each. They, together with some of the uh, other major transportation firms in this region, are play a key role in better transit. Uh, Laura's team played a key role in the bus transportation project itself as a consultant to that uh, uh, work with AECOM, and also um, led Baltimore's network redesign, among many other projects, which she'll tell you about. Uh, I first met Scudder and the Jarrett Walker team uh, during the Richmond network redesign a few years ago, which was also very successful. Um, uh, and, you know, honestly, we've become disciples of better of bus planning, many of us, because we can see the benefits of bus network redesign done in a collaborative process uh, to provide greater frequency, reliability, better ridership, greater efficiency, while improving access to jobs. And that's what these firms do. And that's what you're going to hear about today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Laura right now, who will share her screen for her presentation. And we'll do Q&A. Uh, after both presentations. So again, put your questions in the chat and we'll collect them and we'll get to them as quickly as possible. Laura. Thank you, Stuart. Can, can everybody see my screen? <clears throat> yes. Great, then I'll go ahead. Uh, I wanted to thank Stuart for inviting me here to talk to everybody today about this really timely topic. topic. It's one that I feel really strongly and passionately about. Uh, and I'm really honored to share the stage, so to speak, with uh, Mayor Wilson and with Scudder. So, uh, 
Before I get into talking about bus network redesigns, I just did want to quickly introduce my company and myself. Um, and my company first, because my involvement in bus network redesigns is largely due to the amazing work of our entire team I'm just here representing. So Foursquare ITP is a multimodal transportation planning firm. We focus on solutions that are practical and implementable, and we re rely heavily on the latest data processing and tools, as well as extensive collaboration to develop solutions to transportation's biggest challenges. And regional transportation planning and bus service and operations planning are at the very core of what we do as a company. And personally, I've been very involved in several of the bus network redesigns that we've done, including Baltimore Link, Hampton Roads, Jacksonville Transit. And I was also the principal investigator on two recent TCRP reports, uh, the TCRP Synthesis 140, which is about comprehensive bus network redesigns, and also TCRP Report 221 on redesigning transit networks for the new mobility future. And finally, I'm a transit rider. Uh, while I currently do have a car and I'm a multimodal traveler, I spent 10 years living car free uh, back in the day when we didn't have a transit app and we just had to carry a big pack of schedules in our bags. So um, bring that, that empathy to the folks that we're, that we're working with every day. So with that, uh, let me talk about what it, a bus network redesign is. Uh, it's more than just redrawing bus routes. Uh, certainly simplifying the bus system to make it easier to understand, more reliable, and have higher frequency are all important. And in fact, this particular bus network redesign in Muskegon, Michigan, um, that we planned, which was just implemented during the pandemic, has been, ridership's been improving and it's been receiving great reviews, um, but it's more than just the bus routes. Um, a bus network redesign really needs to focus about on designing service and improvements based on the goals set forward at the outset of the project. So it's really critical that these goals are collaboratively developed and socialized, which helps set the stage for better support of the recommendations later on. So for example, the goals could be access to more jobs and destinations in a certain amount of time that this video was showing, or a goal could be that resources should be distributed equitably across the region, potentially emphasizing services that both serve uh, a lot of ridership, but also serve riders with a high equity need. Uh, regardless of what the goals are, the plan really should be geared towards meeting them, whether it's access to jobs, equitable distribution of service, uh, reduction in travel time, increase in ridership. Um, and then of course the goals might be in direct conflict with each other, which is why as part of a redesign, it's really important to evaluate trade-offs. Uh, it's critical that everyone understand that trade-offs will need to be made in order to best meet the goals while staying within close to or about the budget that is out there today for operating transit, for operating transit and also on the capital side investments there. Um, I've just listed a few of the trade-offs here, but um, there's lots to consider and they're, they're often in direct conflict, conflict with each other. So it's important to have those conversations throughout the process. Bus network redesign is also about communicating the very real impacts that it will have and making sure people see how it will impact them. So the messaging has to resonate with both stakeholders, but also with the riding public. Stakeholders and elected officials will want to weigh the anticipated impacts at the network level. So overall increase in ridership or increase in access to jobs. But the riding public will want to see how the changes impact them at the root level because as hard as we might try, you cannot educate riders to be empathetic to what's best for the system. They will naturally and reasonably wanna know how the changes will impact them. Again, it's not just about the bus routes and the schedules. Planners need to account for capital improvements such as bus priority to make the routes go faster, passenger amenities and capital projects related to operations like transfer facilities and operating divisions. Bus network redesign is also about dialogue, um, giving people ownership in the process, whether it's talking with people at a bus stop, talking with operators in their break room, regional leaders at a stakeholder workshop, or residents at a pop-up event, or even online um, through information sharing, office hours, and surveys. Um, dialogue is so important. Uh, redesigns really require many touch points with all of these groups. Um, in terms of getting them to understand the importance of bus, what it means for the region in terms of access to opportunity, economic sustainability, and equity. And of course, what it means for them personally, whether as a rider, potential rider, or as a bus operator. It's really important through this dialogue that we give the riders agency over the changes, make them feel empowered through the process to play a key role in the, in the decisions that must be made. 
Um, there's different ways to do that. Um, for example, relying on community-based organizations to reach out to, to people as well as local ambassadors to help get the message out to their communities. I also did wanna take a moment to talk about one of the most often forgotten groups of stakeholders and that's the bus drivers. Um, it's really important to establish trust with them and maintain an open and ongoing dialogue. It's always been a critical part of redesigns um, in part because the drivers can provide great information and insight as we're developing recommendations for route changes. Um, also because they're gonna be the front line when the network redesign is implemented, they're gonna be the first people that riders go to with questions. Um, and also more importantly now with the bus operator shortages everywhere, it's so important that driver, the drivers feel ownership and agency in the plan to make them feel like they're a part of it. Most importantly, bus network redesigns are about flexibility and adaptability. Um, just like any other thoughtful planning process, they're not formulaic. The approach to a bus network redesign in Brooklyn and Boise cannot and should not be the same. Um, they'll have different goals, different populations, demographics, and of course, different levels of transit use. Um, and in addition to being flexible, the planners and agencies really need to be adaptable as the plan, the planning pro process progresses. Uh, you know, things, things are changing. There'll be requests that come in. There'll be um, pivots to how we approach things and being adaptable has to be at the forefront. So now I'll just take a couple minutes to talk about some of the benefits of bus network redesigns, as well as some of the challenges that, um, that we'll face in this region doing a bus network redesign. Uh, first, um, as Stuart mentioned, we did plan the Baltimore Link bus network redesign. Um, and so some examples um, can be of benefits can be measured just in terms of access to service, either service in general or high frequency service uh, by certain populations, such as low income or single vehicle households. Um, or access to jobs. So for example, the Baltimore Link Network that was implemented increased access to transit by vulnerable populations, whether they're low income or seniors by about 30% each, and also provided access to 15% more jobs, which was one of the key goals of the plan. And there are also ridership benefits. Um, ridership benefits of redesigns right now are a little hard to measure if they were implemented before COVID um, due to the, the last two years. But for example, in Baltimore, when this was implemented in June of 2017, ridership had been trending downward consistently since 2015. When Once it was implemented and prior to the pandemic, weekday ridership had stabilized and a weekend ridership was up, um, including 13% on Sundays. And more locally in Fairfax County, uh, we've been, the county chose to replan their system in five groupings and we've been working with them on all, all of those. Um, so the benefits analysis here is just shown for the area um, around this new silver line that this, this system will be implemented in concert with, with that whenever that, that does happen. Um, but the benefits of the plan show a decrease in travel time between key origins and destinations, uh, such as dense residential areas with job, just job centers and healthcare facilities, as well as an increase in the population, specifically uh, minority and low income populations that'll have access to service. Um, as well as an increase in access to the higher frequency service. Uh, and also the plan in Fairfax County get, will increase the distance to which riders can get to within a given amount of time by transit. So now that we've talked about some of the benefits, uh, I wanted to hit on some of the biggest challenges. So I think it goes without saying that in this region, we have a lot of bus operators. Um, there are eight uh, local bus operators, and this is not to mention all the roadway owners and um, jurisdictions that control the roadways for bus priority, that control the sidewalks for passenger amenities and bus stops and, and, and so forth. Um, but this isn't the first bus network redesign that involves multiple providers. Um, a great example is Los Angeles um, and it can be done. It just requires more coordination and another layer to the planning. Another key challenge um, in this region and any region that's embarking on a bus network redesign now is COVID. Um, you know, let's not forget that typically bus network redesigns rely on data and travel trends from recent months and recent years. Uh, and of course, the last two years have not been typical. So determining how to blend today's information with what could be the travel needs of the future will require some creativity and finessing in the, on the planning process. And finally, uh, and perhaps most importantly, uh, and this is not unique to, to this region, but it's important to remember that while we're planning a really um, 
really shiny new system, which is really exciting, then we have to remember the people uh, that this will impact the most are the everyday riders. So sometimes when doing a bus network redesign, planners can forget that what might be good from a system perspective, like better average route productivity, faster speeds by staying out of neighborhoods, may not be good from a rider perspective. Um, the people that rely on the bus every day, as we all know, are relying on it to get them to usually multiple jobs, childcare, healthcare, shopping, educational opportunities, basically anywhere they need to go. And what we as planners sometimes see as, as good from a performance perspective will often be viewed as just another element of chaos in their already difficult lives. So while in the end, this redesign will actually be a benefit to the individual riders, so we don't, we don't necessarily want to just um, um, not implement the changes, it's important that we really consider the everyday rider and be, keep empathy as a core value in our approach to the planning. So now that I've talked a little bit about what a bus network redesign is and benefits and challenges, I just want to quickly go through the process for a bus network redesign. Obviously, it's a flexible process, but this is just at a high level in general. Um, we look at three key elements when we're planning bus, the new service and the associated capital improvements for a bus network redesign. First, we look at what the market says. So what are the travel needs throughout the region uh, in terms of overall demand for travel, but also specifically for transit? Then we look at the current service, uh, looking at both the traditional performance metrics of routes across, of course, across various time periods due to the impacts of COVID, but also digging into some of the details that's causing current delay in buses so that solutions can focus on addressing that. And last, but most importantly, we take into account what people have to say through extensive intentional engagement at key points in the process with all of those stakeholders that we've mentioned earlier. Um, and when all of this information is considered together, you come up with a balanced and holistic approach to developing the plans for the bus network redesign. Another key element to developing a balanced plan, a balanced plan that focuses on the region's goals, uh, once we have the information described in the last slide, is to focus on design principles and follow principles for how to design service in different ways that'll meet different needs. And we also develop and follow service standards for consistency, whether it's standards and goals related to the route length, the route directness, how frequent the routes should be at different times of day in different parts of the region, and stop and route spacing along those routes. And in the process of replanning the system, we also need to be open to the right solution for each situation, identifying where in the region different service types might work better than others. So not just looking at where will transit work, but what type of transit will work where, whether it's local fixed route service, express style commuter service, bus rapid transit or priority bus, or even on demand and micro transit. Another key part of the process is using online interactive tools that allow planners, operators, stakeholders, and the public to be on the same page and be engaged and understand the needs and the impacts of the choices and trade-offs, giving people that opportunity to engage in a way that they can understand what's happening. And now if you'll indulge me for less than two minutes, I wanna share this video um, that shows another example of how interaction between planners and stakeholders and the public can be used to collaboratively interact and make decisions. Uh, so I'm gonna play this, uh, I hope the sound will work. Um, and this is just a brief snippet from a bus network redesign that we're currently conducting in suburban Minneapolis. And with that, let me click and I will Place. MBTA and Southwest Transit are completing a system-wide study to plan transit service over the next five years. We created different scenarios for the future of transit in the region and then solicited your feedback on those scenarios. Now we have a draft final network of proposed changes to share with you. Some of the improvements to bus service include changes to frequency, or how often a bus arrives at any given stop, hours of service, the hours during the day that a bus route provides service, and route realignments, or changes to where a bus route goes, such as the overall length of the route and which bus stops it serves. In this video, we'll present two theoretical bus riders and how their trips will be made easier and quicker based on the proposed changes. At the end of the video, we'll explain the ways that you can share your feedback 
to make sure your voice is heard about the proposed changes. Now, it's time to explore your trip. Our project website has a lot of tools to explore these proposed changes more, including a trip comparison tool. You can enter a location and the tool shows what your trip looks like today and what it would look like under the proposed changes. It also has information like bus routes, transfers, and travel time. MVTA Connect and Southwest Prime are options now and in the future too. You can see these in the trip comparison tool as well. We want to know what you think about these proposed changes. Visit the project. Okay, thank, thank you for, for that. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. I just wanted to show another way that um, folks can be collaborated with across many Laura, platforms. We'll you, Laura, we'll need you to wrap up within a minute here. MBTA. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yep, I'll be wrapped up. Um, and besides uh, working with stakeholders, I did just want to touch on the importance of regular ongoing collaboration with all parts of all agencies. So everyone from planning and scheduling to capital projects to finance and civil rights across the agencies. And of course, in this region, across many agencies, um, because ongoing conversations are, are really key. Uh, and of course, we need to keep our eye on the prize, which is actually putting the great plan onto the street. So making sure that agencies are checking early in the process on the impacts of the changes on capital improvements, whether new uh, transfer facilities might, need it, might, might be needed or whether um, additional bus bays might be needed and certainly conducting equity analysis all along the way to avoid surprises at the end. The last part of pre-implementation uh, is extensive communication in all forms, making sure that we get to as many people as possible so it's not a surprise. Um, and finally, um, just when you think the process is done, we shouldn't just drop it and leave. Um, agencies need to continue to modify and revisit through service and ridership modeling, monitoring. And that's the beauty of buses, right? Like with the right amount of investment in bus priority, passenger amenities, and agency support facilities, buses can provide really high quality transportation, but they're also flexible enough to allow the agency to commit to future changes if needed. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, the Laura. you guys are all getting a college course in just a few minutes here on bus planning. We're going to turn to Scudder, stop sharing, Laura, and then Scudder will start sharing while Scudder's getting set up. Um, there was one question about EVs. I think we'll hold that for a future forum when we talk about bus technologies, including the benefits of electric uh, vehicles. And then the other question really is the core of what we're talking about today, and Scudder can probably touch upon it in his presentation. And the question is, should high frequency bus routes be focused on a single high density arterial corridor connecting a variety of higher intensity land uses uh, or a selection uh, of both? Well, that's what, you know, this is the trade offs that both of these firms work on. So go ahead, Scudder. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, thank you, Laura, Julie, everyone uh, from the Metro Now Coalition for inviting me to be here today and to, to Laura for that overview. Um, and I wanna focus as much as I can on the high level aspects of what goes into thinking about a bus network redesign. And you know, a bus network redesign is that opportunity to think big picture, to think long-term about the structure of what network should be for the whole city, for the whole region. And therefore, in our work, we often come at it from the angle of, let's talk about what can transit achieve for the community, for the city, and starting from the wall around your life. This is a person. She's in a city, in a region, in a, in a place full of possible destinations. This is where she can go in 45 minutes. And in that area, all the jobs she can hold, all the places she can shop, all the medical services she could access. And that is, in essence, the freedom, the liberty that she has. And a bus network redesign offers us an opportunity to say, how can we potentially expand that for her, for lots of other people uh, to maximize freedom and opportunity? So as an example, from our work in Dublin, we, where can you go in 45 minutes from Dublin City University? In the existing network, you can reach this much area. In the proposed network that we put together for Dublin, you could reach this much area. And that's 43% more jobs, 43% more places she could work, places she could shop, places she could reach medical destinations, 
that's also 68% more residents that could reach her. And if she were a business owner, a retailer in that location, that's 68% more um, customers who could reach her. Uh, and by, by measuring this, we're measuring the ability for people to achieve enormous economic benefits, not just for jobs, but for education, for shopping and so on. We're measuring in, a, in effect social inclusion, how much uh, opportunity do people have to socially be involved with all of the things in their city, in their region, in their place, uh, and ultimately liberty. <laughs> We're also showing what's possible for how network design can affect customers and can affect a lot of other things that we care about, like the sustainability benefits. The more useful a transit network is for more people to get more places, the more likely they are to use it. And so it directly assesses that uh, potential for getting more people to ride, getting more people to therefore not use cars, uh, all the emissions benefits that come from that, and then all of the ways that that supports dense and walkable development and redevelopment, and you know potentially revenue if if we care about that. So it connects to all of these various and sundry goals that we often care about. But it's a challenge because that's not the only goal that people want transit to serve. And so we encourage agencies, we encourage cities to be very thoughtful and careful in creating a reality-based conversation with the public that very carefully separates the facts like that fact about how the design of a network can affect your access from the values that transit can ultimately uh, potentially achieve. So we like to think of it as like a plumbing problem. Your plumber comes into your house, you have a, you have a problem with your drain, he looks at it and he says, well, <clears throat> we could spend $500 and fix the problem and it's gonna be fixed for 10 years, or I could spend $100 and it will be more affordable and it might break in a year or two. And your plumber is asking you a question about your values of cost versus reliability. And in transit and bus network redesigns, we want to be very carefully separate those values from the questions of, fa of facts. So putting these trade-off questions very carefully before the public, before stakeholders, uh, in multiple phases of a process, like should we design the network that would get the most access to opportunity, knowing it's gonna disrupt people's uh, existing travel patterns? Uh, can we ask people to transfer if it's gonna get them there sooner? Would you rather walk farther if you could wait less? Or do you want a shorter wait? Um, or should we emphasize high ridership and high access or higher coverage? Because we know these things come in conflict and weighing them is critical to deciding what you do with your networks. And engaging people very directly and understanding how and why that reality is the case is a fundamental way we help stakeholders, policy leaders uh, understand the challenge. So in Alexandria, we hosted a stakeholder workshop at the very beginning of our engagement process and brought people to the table to really experience the, the challenge of transit tools. Um, and we went to the public early in the very first phases with abstract general questions about whether do you want to walk a shorter distance and wait longer or are you willing to walk farther to wait less to really engage people in the uh, beginning to think about these challenges. Um, but at the heart of what we think is most helpful in, in a bus network redesign process is to really show people the potential outcomes. And so in Richmond, for example, we designed two networks a high ridership network and a high coverage network. This is the high coverage network where the frequency is shown by the color. Red is 15 minutes, blue is 30 minutes, green is 60 minutes. This is the network for them that would have prioritized coverage relative to the resources they had. And then this was the network that would prioritize high access, high ridership, high frequency. And you see a lot more red on this map, but you also see a lot of places that don't have service that did in the high coverage map. We took this approach also in Alexandria, showing a similar trade-off between a network that is higher ridership oriented and or high coverage oriented in this case. And you see the significant difference. And by going to the public with these comparisons, we can very clearly show what is the difference going to be. Miami, again, we had a comparison of three different uh, opportunities, the existing network, again, color scheme, red, blue, to green generally showing the frequency, 
the coverage network and the ridership network. And most importantly, in this process, bringing people the examples of how does it change your access to opportunity? How does it change your walks? How does it change your, your, your potential to reach places? So the existing network in Miami from Liberty Square, particularly high poverty uh, neighborhood uh, in the northern part of the city of Miami, um, the coverage network significantly increased their job access, 65% increase in jobs reachable. The ridership network dramatically increased their uh, job access, 165% increase in jobs reachable. And we can assess that freedom outcome across the entire uh, system. So all of Miami-Dade County, we could say that the coverage network increased their access by 27%, the ridership by 42%. And we can look at it for those populations of concern. Uh, in this case, the average person in poverty, you saw a 28% a increase in the coverage network, a 44% increase in access under the ridership network. So doing slightly better for people in poverty, people of color, lots of different uh, groups that we can assess. And in Miami, another key piece there was we were able to show that working across multiple agencies who ran their own services, what could you do if you were able to produce a network where that was all put together as one seamless network that was the most useful possible, which is the same approach we took working with uh, Dash and WMATA. And uh, for Miami, we could show an enormous benefit just from the ability to use those resources across all of the operators in the most effective way. And then extending that to the conversation with the public then, um, in Dallas, we were able to not only just show these numbers or show these isochrone examples, but also turn those into some stories and working with the staff there and taking some ideal customers from different parts of the community and saying, how would their lives change? How would their access change? And in this example, um, this Isabella, this uh, example person, uh, had a significant improvement, a 40 minute reduction in their travel time um, from the existing network to the high ridership network. Using interactive tools, we can take this story further so that anyone could explore their own trip, their own opportunities. Uh, and so our draft network that's about to launch in Suffolk County, New York, people can explore, here's the existing network, here's the new network. That's a huge change. Wow, that might mean a longer walk for me. What does it mean if I live in this area where we're taking a route away? Well, yes, it means a longer walk, but the frequency improvement means you can actually reach 14,000 more jobs in an hour with this change. And that goes a long way to helping people see what is the value of that trade-off. Because at the end of the day, in a, net, in a big network redesign, if you are making really big changes that have enormous benefits, you're gonna upset 10,000 people in 10,000 different ways. And that's gonna be controversial. And most of these plans are ultimately very controversial and are controversial in, cor in correlation to how big the benefits are. But if you are against all of that change, you're against this. You're against a 48% increase in the average person's access, a 67% increase in the average access for residents of color or 59% for low-income residents, which is enormous. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, a similar outcome. Average person could reach 11% more jobs in 60 minutes across their network with their changes. And coming back to Alexandria, we could show people, yes, there were, there were pluses and minuses across the city, but on average, you could reach 13% more jobs in 45 minutes. And that was a huge uh, selling point to the eventual implementation uh, of the bus network redesign. So to sum up, talking about freedom and opportunity is something that speaks to almost everyone's uh, interest in what transit can do. Um, separating the facts from values is absolutely critical to helping people think through what their values are and how that can be expressed in the transit system. Asking people about those real trade-offs is ultimately central to determining what are the values and goals that the plan ought to express. And then being clear and showing how the policy changes, network changes, increases investment, whatever the plan ultimately tries to achieve can do for people's opportunity and freedom. So with that, um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to give you just this snippet uh, of how we approach the question and the challenge of bus network redesigns. Uh, thank you, Scudder. Thank you, Laura. Uh, a wealth of information. I'm gonna have to go back and look at the recording to, to 
take notes again on everything we're learning here. We've got some great questions. We've got a few minutes for questions. I'm going to start with um, the most recent one first because it's always a top topic. Uh, the question is, can't on-demand micro mobility fill in many holes, making a high-frequency network more palatable? While you're thinking about that, I note that uh, Mayor Wilson is still with us. So if you have a specific question for the mayor, we really appreciate him taking his time to be here away from being mayor and working at Amtrak. So, uh, so uh, thank you, Mayor, for staying with us. So this first question about micromobility filling in the gaps. Yeah, I can, I can start on that. Um, I mentioned that in one of my slides. I think that it's really important to look at different services for different parts of the region and even different times of the day. So there might be a place within the region where um, local bus service makes sense during the day, but maybe not after eight o'clock at night. Um, there also might be a place where there's a lot of high frequency service, but for a lot of the people living there, it might be a five or 10 minute walk. And so microtransit can help fill in those gaps to get them to, to the, the, the services. So again, it's not it's not just where transit will work, but where, where different types of transit will work has to be looked at holistically um, when you're doing a redesign, in, in my opinion. I, I would add that, yeah, there are places and times where uh, on-demand services can more cost-effectively provide some kind of coverage to uh, fill in gaps. Um, that was a significant part of the work that we did in uh, Dallas, for example. The ultimate challenge we face is when you look at the cost to provide those kinds of on-demand services, um, they can be less, but they're not always dramatically less than the cost of fixed route services on a per hour basis. And so then the question becomes, are you serving, how many people are you serving per hour? And are you, is your cost per rider going to be less than just running some sort of fixed route service uh, in place of the on-demand service. Uh, and so the, the niche and the opportunities um, we've found tend to be somewhat limited in where you can more cost-effectively use on-demand tools, um, but they are part of the menu of options that can help you fulfill those needs. Okay, um, I'm, since the mayor's with us, I'm gonna go, a couple of questions have come his way. Um, one or was, um, what are the couple of questions he had to answer or uh, or objections to overcome to make dash buses free. And the second one is related to that. Um, how do you analyze it and measure the trade-off between removing fares versus using it to further expand the network or increase frequency? Yeah, you know, as, as I said earlier, I, I think we did grapple with some of these questions and I think we will continue to grapple with some of these questions. I think, you know, this is, um, in, in some ways, we are taking advantage of the moment we were in. Ridership was so low. Um, we had gone fare free for a little while during the pandemic, so we had already done kind of a bit of an experiment. And so it seemed like an ideal moment to, to kind of continue that experiment as both a way to get people back to transit, but also to help um, some of our vulnerable communities um, during this time. Um, you know, we have some unique challenges in going fare free in this region, I think one of which is um, under normal circumstances, we have an enormous number of um, our residents who are receiving uh, transit benefits, most of whom from the federal government um, through their employers. And so by going fare free, we are um, we are knowingly leaving a bunch of federal money on the table um, that uh, that otherwise uh, would be money we would ultimately receive um, uh, by way of uh, by way of these federal employees who are uh, receiving those benefits. And so that was certainly a trade off that uh, that we grappled with. And then I think uh, Alex's question is 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 apt as well, which and I think we heard this um, during the process from our board of directors actually uh, on Dash is, you know, is this increased subsidy, is this increased investment to fund fare free coming at the expense of investment that could be used um, to, to further expand the network and, and, and reduce, um, reduce headways. And I think that's definitely something, it's definitely a challenge that I think we, we grappled with um, on the council. And I think we're gonna continue to grapple with as we go forward. I think, you know, this is, this is nominally a pilot. We will see how this um, goes. Um, you know, we had done some experiments even prior to the pandemic where we had um, uh, allowed school children uh, to, uh, to use um, our system for free um, and had seen enormous success um, with that. 
But for a lot of our residents, uh, the, the cost is a barrier, not just um, for riding, you know, for, for those essential trips, but for those non-essential trips, the, you know, the, the trips where you have other options. And, and I think it's a, it's a psychological barrier. And so, you know, we'll see how this goes. We'll measure the data and we'll determine whether this uh, makes sense going forward. So, uh, but, but we're excited about it. And we've seen and the, the results, I think, combined with the network implementation ha has been a positive on the short term. Governor Laura, any thoughts on the trade-off uh, between um, free fares and the, your networks? Um, I would just say that it is, it's a value choice ultimately about what is it you're, you're spending your money on. Um, we've worked with communities uh, like Eugene, Oregon that have explored this and we have helped them look at, okay, what does it mean if you were to invest that money in service? What could you afford? What additional span or, or more frequency um, or lower fares or no fares? Uh, and I, I think putting the options to the community and showing them what it is you could get on either side of that trade-off is the most helpful way to approach it. Okay, terrific. Uh, Steve Cavan has a good point uh, talking about, you know, how to engage the public in the WMATA processes and so forth. I think we'll have to save that for a separate time. And Douglas Stewart talked about reaching out to new residents and new developments uh, who may not be bus riders yet. I think those are important outreach questions. I'm going to stick though to the um, one question was about how do you assure service reliability in your redesign, such as assuring that buses stay on time. And related to that, I'd like to know, you know, how important are dedicated lanes in some cases to make that happen? Laura, Scudder. Yeah, um, dedicated lanes and also other forms of bus priority are, are really important to to. And when I say that, I mean things like queue jumps or signal priority priority or even bus bulbs so that the bus doesn't have to pull into a stop and then pull back out into traffic. They're all, there's lots of tools in the, in the toolbox. Um, there's also service changes. So for example, simplifying alignments so that they're not, the buses are not meandering through too many, too many streets and keeping them, them in a straight line, um, standardizing bus stop design, minimizing um, or optimizing the number of bus stops so that the bus isn't stopping on on every street corner and therefore being subject to, to potentially more um, stops at, at signals. Um, and then it's also um, making sure that the tools um, and inf information are provided to customers. So we can do what we can through service design and through, um, through capital improvements to make the buses more reliable, but even just providing the information to people and people knowing that, okay, my bus is five minutes late, but at least I know that is, is an important tool to making people feel that uh, they have some control over their trip. I would just add that yes, uh, speed and reliability improvements like bus lanes are kind of for free money in transit. You know, the, the cost of transit is the day-to-day -day operations. That is the, the enormous challenge of, of bus transit in particular. <clears throat> and so if you can increase the speed of your service by 10%, you can provide 10% more capacity. Speed is capacity. So in congested regions like ours, um, it is absolutely essential if you want to make the most effective use of your resources. Uh, thank you. And we're gonna include uh, bus, uh, dedicated bus lanes and transit priority in a future forum by Metro Now on our, for our bus champions roundtable forums. Here's an important question. How do you balance disability equity? Um, you know, uh, you know the, the disabled, the elderly, others, who might have to walk uh, farther to get to a bus stop as you redesign a network, perhaps for a little bit more frequent, say more frequent routes. Um, how do you meet the needs of uh, those populations while doing these network redesigns? Well, I think one of the ways we, we try to do that is to be sure that through stakeholder engagement processes, through public surveying processes that we're including representatives from uh, disabled uh, and elderly uh, advocacy organizations and uh, social service organizations uh, and asking in the surveys that we take whether people have disabilities so we can see how their responses may differ from the rest of you know the, res the respondents in the process um, and use that as part of the ways that we shape the policy conversation around how the community resolves these value trade-offs because the, yes, the, one of the critical aspects of, of going through these value trade-offs is 
understanding that different groups, uh, groups that may need specific empathy about particular issues may have different perspectives on these value questions. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. we, Laura, sorry. I was just gonna add one thing to what, what Scudder just said, which is that um, you know, when we're thinking about walking um, to transit, it, it certainly it impacts disabled populations and seniors, but it really impacts um, anybody who's, who's walking. The people who are taking transit to everything, they're walking, you know, several times a day. And every, every time they're walking 15 minutes versus five minutes really is an impact to their quality of life. Um, so it's important to kind of balance the needs of the system with the needs of the individuals. Um, and it's something that, that, um, that needs to be looked at, not just in, um, in stated preference surveys, because like in Baltimore, we found everybody said, oh, we'd love more frequent service. I'm willing to walk farther. But then when it comes down to it, when they're the one that has to walk farther, they're not so happy about it. So it's really important to balance um, the, have a balance between forcing long walks, um, you know, not, not just for disabled people, but for, although that's a key consideration, but for everybody with, um, with having service that's maybe not as, as um, effective. So really important question um, for, for lots, of, lots of different people. Not, not to mention the importance of making these routes, uh, these walking routes safer and sidewalks better and the connect crossing safer, uh, something we often don't invest enough in for sure. Uh, for a final question, and, and then we'll wrap up. Um, this is about the fact that this region is about to embark on a network redesign. Uh, WMATA is in procurement on it right now. That's why they couldn't join us today to talk about it. Um, and But they're going to be working with Ride On in Montgomery and Dash in Alexandria and Fairfax Connector in Fairfax, et cetera. Uh, Mayor Wilson, how are we going to pull this off? Are, are our elected officials and our agencies going to uh, you know, and we're not all going to play well together to make this happen. I hope so, because um, I think we have to. And 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 I think you know, we all um, you know we all in local government get excited about borders, um, but our residents don't. Um, there's nothing magical about um, those those arbitrary lines we draw um, between our jurisdictions. And and I think uh, if we continue to think in these kind of uh, parochial jurisdictional uh, uh, arenas, then we're never going to provide the kind of compelling high frequency transit service um, that that all of our residents um, expect and, and can benefit from. And and I think that's uh, the, you know coordinating across these lines is going to be critical. Absolutely. We and we're going to need all of you to be bus champions. Uh, please thank our speakers today, Mayor Wilson, Laura, and Scudder. Uh, thank our to our Metro Now partners here and all of you for being involved. Many of you work in the business. Please be our bus champions. We need to do all this together. One thing to push for right now is save operating funding in each of the states. Uh, keep the Get the feds back into the operating funding game as they did during their emergency funding. I will note that the grocery tax cut in Virginia will mean a cut to transit operating dollars, and we're going to have to find a way to fill in that gap. And we can't do better bus services without the funding. So thank you all. And I know you're heading all heading off to your other meetings. And I see Clayton there. Go back going back to the General Assembly battles. All right. Thank you all. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentations. Thank you all. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. It's never a meeting without at least two Lauras. <laughs> <laughs> we bring we bring it. <laughs> And I think Mayor Wilson hopped off, but that was like, we couldn't have asked for a better uh, a slam dunk of an ending note, I think. So yeah. great, great, great words. Thanks, Stuart, for coordinating all this. We had 115 or 116 at the peak and everybody stuck with us, uh, except maybe 110 at the very end there. And then people then had to run to their meetings. <laughs> I've got to run to another one. So thanks again, Stuart. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, nice to see you, Scudder. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Bye.